the unique feature of this collaboration was that all the content from Disney, Pixar, and Marvel was made uh, available to users absolute, absolutely free. Uh, mm-hmm. This is uh, actually uh, unusual for the market. Podcast. Hey there, don't forget to comment, subscribe, and share this episode. It's really important for us. And now, to the episode itself. Hey there, my name is Tan, I'm VP of Product at AppMagic, and also host here on Games and Names Podcast, a podcast where we talk about games and the people who make them. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with AppMagic, an analytical service for analyzing mobile markets and gaining actionable insights. Today, we've got a really, really interesting topic to cover. We're discussing how to maintain games success for the longest time possible. What are the main strategies? What are the best approaches? What is the right and the wrong way? And of course, I'm not alone. Today, joining me, Dmitry, CEO of Zimat, who has been successfully working in the company for more than 10 years. Dmitry, welcome to the cast. Hi, Stan. Hi, everyone. Yeah, glad that you've joined us today. Uh, maybe let's start with a little of introduction to kick it off. Tell us something about you, about Zimat, about your whole approach to the gaming. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as for me, I have about uh, 15 years of experience in the industry. I entered it uh, as a C++ and then Java developer. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> then, yeah, uh, then I advanced to managerial positions and have been leading Zimat for almost 11 years for now. And I still can't believe that really <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> and uh, a couple of facts about Zimat. It's a publisher of games uh, for mobile, social, and desktop. Uh, we've been on the market since uh, 2009, uh, just a year after the launch of Android Market. That was a long time ago. Uh, the company has released dozens of products in a variety of genres, and it wasn't only games. We also launched uh, entertainment apps and even interactive books. And uh, until uh, uh, 2016, before the rebranding, uh, tens of millions of players knew us uh, as uh, Xymat with the letter X at the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. uh, nowadays, uh, Zimat is well known for its titles like Magic Jigsaw Puzzles, Puzzle Villa, Dominus Online, and Art of Puzzles. Uh, as for magic puzzles, uh, magic jigsaw puzzles is known for working with the strong IPs such as Disney, Sony Pictures, and others. Uh, the game is the largest collection of digital puzzles on the market, uh, with over uh, forty thousand licensed images and more than one hundred and fifty all-time downloads. And uh, I think that's enough for an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitri. That's a really great introduction about both the company and the games. So let's try and kick it off with with an obvious elephant in the room. So you've mentioned magic jigsaw puzzles, and it's a big thing. So for the listeners out there who don't know about it, it's the biggest game in uh, Zimat portfolio, who has been on the market, just think about it, for more than 12 years, supporting its revenue and downloads on a very impressive level. So an obvious question here is how a game can be successful for such an extended period of time. So what is the secret sauce, if I may? So Dmitry, share your recipe. How do you cook it? What is the secret sauce? Yeah, um, if we talk about um, uh, live ops, for example, uh, the secret sauce uh, here primarily lies in our careful attention to what our specific audience likes. Uh, the target audience uh, in the jigsaw puzzle subgenre is adults, mostly women. And the most loyal audience here is over uh, 50 years old. Uh, we have carefully studied and continue to study uh, player preferences in various ways. For example, we have a detailed user persona. We know their interests in mm-hmm. real life. We engage them in interacting with each other uh, through the game and community. We involve them in common causes such as open votes or charity campaigns. Um, uh, we certainly have a system of traditional 
live ops or for casual products, but it can be different uh, from classic live ops, for example, in match the game. Uh, here, uh, it's seriously adapted for the target audience. For instance, we know that uh, the vast majority of our players do not like to feel stressed in the game and compete. Mm -hmm. So in the Magic Jigsaw puzzles, you won't find real-time pressing, knockout challenges, and so on. Um, we also work on uh, implementing different uh, player motivations through live ops. For example, we promote uh, the idea of importance of brain training, uh, cognitive function support. Uh, it's scientifically proven that assembling puzzles helps with this. Um, we just want our players not just relax while playing mm -hmm. the game, but also prevent some uh, progressive diseases as well. Uh, playing with children and grandchildren is also a separate motivation for these categories uh, play of players who have specific activities and content. Uh, besides, we adapt the game to different players' motivations, working with uh, custom flows uh, across the entire funnel. I mean, uh, it's starting with ad creative in user acquisition, uh, followed by landing page on the store, and then uh, in-game customized onboarding flow. So this is all about uh, live ops of the game. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the most crucial thing here is knowing your player. So knowing who's your current player, how to cater them the best way possible is the well secret sauce as we were discussing for running, uh, running a really successful game. And in your case, it's especially interesting because uh, when we are talking about the majority of the, say, casual market, uh, we're talking about... Uh, Social demographic for match three as women 30 to 40, for shooters and vehicle shooters, men 30 to 50. In your case, in Jigsaw Puzzles, it's women 50 plus, which is a very interesting uh, group of players. And it's really great that you know them really, really deep. This is something we've also heard from uh, in one of the previous episodes we had with Zynga. And the producer, Vikas Menon, was sharing that they have the same approach. So it's really important to know who are your players in order to give more content, more features, and more, basically more everything towards them. But I'm sure that during this period of time, I mean, a decade, mind-blowing, uh, the game has changed and changed a lot. So from your experience, what were the main changes? And um, I'm sure there were different trends during this time. Different markets were on the rise. So how were you making decisions about these changes? How were you deciding which type of changes should appear in the game and which shouldn't? Yeah, I will start with uh, like what the game looked like uh, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the game has indeed changed drastically and continues to evolve every year. Uh, for example, in recent months, we introduced several new features like a brand new My Collection screen, uh, achievement system, and enhanced level progression system. Uh, the product in its current form was launched in the middle of 2011. But before that, there were dozen, dozens of separate games with Magic Puzzles prefix uh, in their name, uh, each dedicated uh, to puzzles of certain categories. It could be paid mm -hmm. games and then free-to-play with that. And then in the middle of uh, 2011, it was replaced by a single game, which became a unified puzzle store. Uh, we were the first such digital puzzle store on the mobile market, and we are proud of it. Uh, and it was a very simple game where you just had to choose a puzzle image from the library and solve it. That's mm -hmm. it. There was no backend. Uh, there was no in-game currency, live ops, daily missions, practically no, none of what exists now. Uh, the game evolved uh, along with the market's evolution, devices, approaches to the game design, uh, along with the emergence of new monetization opportunities. The game evolved based on uh, the analytics we saw, based on the best practices we saw in our genres. Uh, so to sum up on the what the game looked like, I, I could even say that by looking at the versions of uh, MJP over these uh, 12 or more years, you can indeed see the history of the industry itself. Mm -hmm. And as for uh, another topic, uh, as for uh, how we uh, make decision based on the performance, uh, first, uh, I would uh, like to say that we are advocates of a data-driven approach in everything uh, to which it can be applied. Uh, we track uh, players' behavior uh, in great detail, every button press, what images they pick, 
uh, the size and settings of puzzles and much more. Uh, we analyze uh, player profiles, search for common uh, patterns within player groups based on their motivations and demographics. Um, and uh, a distinction in working with a product with such a lifespan is that we often separate old players, so-called tail uh, and new ones, always assessing how changes affect both groups. Uh, as I already mentioned, we can't breach the trust. It's uh, crucial for us. For example, if a change uh, is supported by new players, but the tail reacts negatively to it, uh, we must look uh, for a compromise or sometimes change the game flow only for, for the new ones. Mm-hmm. And this- uh, yeah. That, that's, that's really it. interesting because I yeah. uh, I haven't heard a lot of cases of when you change the flow of the game only for the part of the players based on the new data acquired. That's that's fascinating. I'm really curious. So usually when we are talking about a very long-lasting games, and I worked with a game like that, War Robots, back in the day, uh, a big thing is a. Uh, legacy, so say, either technical depth or limitations that were originally in the game, gameplay limitations, monetization limitations, that's really difficult to to challenge and to surpass. So how did you work with this one? Yeah, <clears throat> of course, we've been facing uh, various limitations over that time. Uh, when you have such an old pro- product, you re- realize that uh, there are many things you would do differently now. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, uh, even the flow of select- selecting a picture became a limitation for us. Uh, surprisingly, uh, the game uses packs, which adds one more step in the funnel. Uh, this is an outdated model, as uh, all modern games in this uh, mechanic uh, have shifted to uh, direct image selection without dividing them into packs in the main flow. Also, as an example, the game was originally designed for uh, big tablet screens, so we had to rework mm-hmm. the UI UX and even the gameplay for smartphones, creating a ported version of uh, one hand interface. Uh, also, um, uh, UI UX becomes outdated over time, so we are very careful in improving it uh, step by step. Mm-hmm. I can also say that we had to make uh, some aspects more casual following uh, the trends of the time. Uh, for example, we eventually uh, introduced what's called screen-by-screen puzzle solving for bigger puzzles, which is a more casual option compared to the zoom-in, zoom-out mechanic. Mm-hmm. Um, we treat carefully such changes because more casual is not always better for the conservative core audience. As I mentioned, it's uh, 15 years plus in our case. Also, we need to keep in mind uh, all hardware or software changes from platforms and devices to be relevant to the market. You've mentioned that you've introduced new things based on the trends of the market, and that's a really interesting thing to discuss. So I'm pretty sure that during these 10, 12 years, there were a lot of competitors new to the market that came there, and they brought new ideas, fresh things, fresh gameplay features. So how did you stay competitive with the game in this niche? So while the jigsaw puzzle game market was evolving, for sure, how were you um, staying on track and maybe even uh, overpassing the competitors? Yeah, if we talk uh, specifically about magic jigsaw puzzles, then yes, we acknowledge that there are new products that might be faster, lighter, and Mm -hmm. in some ways more, so to say, modern, simply because they entered the markets much later and had the chance to build everything from the ground up in a new way. But uh, to our advantage, we have a large uh, player base who recognize uh, Zimat as a trusted partner and even friend, uh, rich team experience, a lot of historical data which guides us. Uh, we continue uh, to develop unique product features that are challenging or impossible to replicate. Um, I would uh, name here such uh, features like uh, custom puzzle pieces shape. So we introduced uh, some uh, custom form of uh, puzzles, like circle mm-hmm. puzzles or puzzles in the form of, of uh, animals or plants, so on. We introduced uh, some kind of uh, internal 
uh, I could call it a mini social network within the game where mm. uh, our players may uh, share their photos and uh, receive some comments, likes, and so on. So there are a lot of uh, unique features for the genre. Uh, this makes us appear to the players as a unique and special product, among others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and here we're not imitators or a copycat. We're a symbol of quality for users. Uh, by the way, uh, sometimes uh, we catch our competitors copying our trademark and visuals, <laughs> and it's very funny. And uh, these distinctive features often enable us to succeed in the competition for players in terms of both uh, user acquisition and retention inside mm-hmm. the game. Nice. That's it, I think. Nice. That's a really funny part about here. Your competitor is trying to copy your trademark without even understanding it, I, I suppose. Financial success, it's not only about the players and having the player base, but also the monetization strategies and monetization techniques. You've mentioned user acquisition, and this part is totally understandable. But I'm really curious, how have you been running monetization in uh, your games and in uh, Magic Jigsaw Puzzle? So uh, what things worked the best? Maybe there were some approaches that you launched with the game 12 years ago, and they're still working like perfectly. Or you decided to, uh, some of them should be discontinued because they were outdated, or you introduced new features. So talking about monetization, how did this part of the product work? Yeah, thanks for the question, great question. Um, So initially when in-apps didn't yet exist in the market, uh, as I mentioned, there were separate Magic Puzzles named games, mm-hmm. which were both uh, paid and free with ads. It was the first step of evolution. Then our game appeared as a unified puzzle store. So it's the uh, original Magic Jigsaw Puzzle game mm-hmm. uh, that was released initially on iOS in uh, 2011. Initially, it was more about single purchases of puzzle packs, so in-app purchases, uh, plus monetization through banner ads and interstitials. But over time, we introduced uh, soft currency in the game and allowed players uh, to accumulate it through rewarded ads as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then the next step, uh, we introduced uh, subscriptions, uh, which now account for the lion's share of all payments in the game. It's uh, more than uh, 70% of mm, all payments nice. in the game. There are weekly, monthly, and uh, annual subscriptions, including a seven-day trial. Uh, and in the subscription, we not only unlock uh, the entire library of puzzles uh, and disable ads, but we also unlock a list of features, including those unique uh, to the genre, uh, as I mentioned, like custom puzzle pieces, shapes, and others. Um, after that, we actually developed uh, a system of uh, daily missions, live ops, and the functionality of leaks, for example. So there are some new monetization points appeared, both from, from in-apps and from ads. Uh, regarding uh, IP-branded content specifically, we started with uh, paid puzzle packs, but then mm-hmm. we transitioned to, com- to completely free-branded content for users, uh, which has been more effective. And overall, uh, this is not the mechanic, this is not the genre where in-app uh, LTVs are high because in this mechanic uh, you can't lose while solving a puzzle as you can, for example, in a match three game where you're limited in turns and lives. So currently payments account for about uh, 30% of revenue depending on the platform region mm-hmm. and the rest are ads. That's it for monetization. All right. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, the basis of the gameplay itself dictates the monetization and the limitations of the monetization. So it's totally understandable. Let us try to uh, switch for a little bit and uh, talk about new games and launching new titles on the market. So apparently uh, during this period of time, during this decade, uh, you launched a lot of games. But the majority of them were still in the uh, jigsaw puzzle niche. Well, we can see that uh, different companies try to tackle different niches, going from Mesh 3, 3 to, I don't know, Idol Tycoon, then to Merge 2. And especially now when so-called hybrid is a thing, com- combining very fast-paced, very easy-to-grasp uh, core gameplay with a 
much more interesting and uh, with a much more interesting meta with a place for progression. So why have you decided to focus on the niche you already know? Uh, maybe that's part of the answer, actually. <laughs> so and still be in it for this long period of time. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, we work with various mechanics and genres, but uh, following the success of Magic Jigsaw Puzzles, we decided to release another major title, uh, Puzzle mm -hmm. Villa, in the Jigsaw Puzzle mechanic. I will talk about uh, this game. Uh, with Puzzle Villa, the logic was quite simple. Uh, primarily, it's the first product uh, on the market that combines Jigsaw Quorum gameplay and full-fledged meta. So we mm -hmm. literally created this segment and occupied it totally for a while. Uh, secondly, as um, uh, we discussed today, um, we, we saw some opportunities while operating, operating with our classic game. Uh, for example, it allows us to consider maybe adding uh, mini games to Puzzle Villa. It's like a hybrid casual approach uh, from the market, but uh, from a, a different angle, when we entertain a player of casual game with other mechanics to give them a break from the monotonous gameplay. Uh, thirdly, uh, by releasing a new product with Meta, we had the opportunity to expand our audience by those who may not be a big fan of Jigsaw Mechanic in the past, but who loves to follow the storyline and loves, loves characters. Uh, uh, the third is, uh, the, the fourth, uh, is that, uh, the decisions on genre selection are made best based on a market analysis, regular tests. I'd say that we try to maintain a balance here. We allocate mm -hmm. about, uh, 70% of resources to what we, uh, to what we are confident with. Currently, these are, uh, mainly casual games for women, mainly puzzles, and we allocate the rest resources uh, in other directions like more hardcore pvp board games midcore products as we're also interested in growing a share of in-app revenue as well as the market dictates dictates uh, these conditions now and uh, here's some easter egg from zimata peers uh, those who know us well may remember that uh, a few years ago we also launched a hardcore ccg uh, game card collectible game in a sci-fi setting called star crusade uh, which gained uh, considerable popularity those days uh, within the target audience. So uh, you never know, really, but uh, Zimat is definitely not only about puzzles. <laughs> <right now. laughs> well, that's that's interesting. Uh, then, as you've mentioned, you had a pretty vast uh, number of releases during this period of time in different genres and niches. So what is your approach when creating a new game? How do you Test hypothesis, how do you work? Uh, what do you test, first of all? And how do you try to increase your chances of success? Because right now it's really, really difficult to launch a new successful game in casual market. So what are your secret approaches or advice uh, for anyone on the market in order to launch a more successful game potentially? Yeah, regarding the uh, approach to new game creation, um, I would say uh, that at the front, forefront of, is the constant monitoring of the market through any available tools, including those powerful like AppMagic, uh, surely. Uh, we're able to identify rising trends. We can see what players are interested in right now by looking at uh, game ranks, their downloads, their metrics, uh, the top performing ad creatives, and form the hypothesis based on that. Uh, the next step uh, is to test these hypotheses with, with minimal costs uh, through a visual image of the potential game. Uh, so we can test here uh, the setting, visual style, um, different core mechanics. We may test a uh, visual, visual image of characters or a storyline, uh, practically anything. Uh, and uh, if we see that the conversion and CPI for this genre satisfy us, we develop an NVP. Uh, starting with the gameplay prototype. Uh, the next stage is to enter uh, technical and soft launches. And in case we satisfied and the metrics are okay, we proceed to the global release. Uh, so the funnel looks something like this. Um, as for the fact that it's almost impossible to release uh, a new successful game, um, 
and how we increase uh, our chances, uh, I can say that uh, the answer is quite simple. First, we increase the chances of success by focusing all our main resources on things we know well, on genres, on audience we know well. Uh, we broaden our expertise in those quite narrow areas, avoid uh, jumping into entirely new directions. Uh, second, we uh, switch to other projects or hypotheses quickly if we're not uh, satisfied with the current results and dynamics. And uh, the last is that it really matters how we conduct tests. The more advanced tests we make, the higher chance of uh, getting the next successful game we have. That's so All simple. Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, make, makes sense. It's simple, but still it's very powerful tools to increase your chance of success. So everybody out there, uh, live and learn. Talking about the market, I think that's a good moment to look at the whole jigsaw, maybe even brain puzzles market as a whole. So as a veteran in the industry, how would you say the market evolved during these years? What were the biggest changes and the biggest trends? Yeah. Um, as for the uh, puzzle category, I'd name uh, the following main uh, uh, reasons of growth itself. Uh, the first uh, possible reason is uh, broad appeal. Uh, puzzle games are appealing to a wide demographic, including all age groups and both uh, casual and hardcore gamers. Uh, the second possible reason is a uh, low entry barrier, because most puzzle games have simple rules and gameplay. Um, and the third uh, major uh, reason uh, for growth is affordable development cost. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, compared to, for example, to uh, real time, time strategies or 3D racing games. Uh, it allows uh, for the rapid creation of a large volume of uh, content, uh, adding to these live ops, social features, mini games, and so on. And uh, as, uh, as for evolution of the puzzle uh, category, uh, as for the milestones, uh, the puzzle landscape is vast and diverse, so I'd better describe uh, the uh, tendencies by dividing the puzzle market market into my uh, own three groups of publishers. Uh, the All first right. group is uh, is the group of publishers who are focused on increasing long term retention and LTV. Uh, following uh, a trend set by studios like Playrix, they uh, began universally integrating meta on top of the simple uh, puzzle mechanics. Then uh, many publishers following the example of, let's say, Real Match uh, saw the need for the meta to be simpler, that makes cheaper and faster in development. Uh, they also integrate mini games or mixed genres to break up the player's routine and retain them longer. Uh, the second group of publishers is like uh, publishers who uh, focused on uh, reducing CPI in the opposite, which eventually grew into a huge market segment called hyper casual. Uh, now, uh, due to problems with traffic ROI, uh, hyper casual is forced to become a hybrid casual. And, uh, the third group, uh, consists of publishers who manage to, uh, release games of absolutely all formation. Looks like they're ignoring all the modern trends. Uh, they simply adjust the well-known core gameplay a bit. Uh, the games are without uh, mixing mechanics, without meta, and still sometimes be truly successful. Uh, I would include in this group uh, subgenres like Jigsaw, uh, Numbers, Hidden Object, uh, Find the Difference, uh, Block Puzzle, and so on. And uh, actually, uh, the puzzle category is remarkable because all these three groups of publishers uh, continue to release successful products every year. That's that's uh, what's so interesting. interesting. That's an interesting yeah. segregation because uh, it's totally understandable. But I haven't heard a structure like that from 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 the industry. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, say, um, how do you think is it possible for? We've discussed that the success rate of new games is really low currently in the casual market. So I wonder, is it possible for a new game to become successful? either in puzzle market as a whole or in jigsaw puzzle market, if we talk more precisely. And what does it take? So what do you need? Say, for example, when we talk about, I don't know, 
Monopoly Go, everyone is looking at Monopoly Go. But then again, you need a very strong IP like Monopoly and you need giant advertising budgets like Scopely has. And then, yeah, we've got a, a hit, but there are a lot of debates right now whether or not this game is prof profitable at the moment, or maybe it's still trying to gather as much as attention as it can. The same goes to, say, uh, Royal Match. Uh, we've had a very interesting talk with uh, one producer from Play Playrix recently, and she mentioned that from, your exp from her experience and from her opinion, she thinks that Royal Match is still not profitable. Yes, the scale of the acquisition, they try to acquire as many possible ways as they can and as many users as they can, but they're not yet even on the breakthrough point, not talking about being profitable. So returning to the question, how do you think, um, is it possible for a new game to become su successful, like really successful, a big hit? And what should be done for that? Yeah, um, really hard question. Uh, I would say that there is always a chance to be successful. Uh, surely, uh, I've previously mentioned three very simplified types of publishers or approaches per my classification. Uh, those striving for high retention and LTV, those fighting for low CPI and those who ignore these trendy trends. Uh, all three approaches are valid as demonstrated by successful releases every year. So the short advice from me uh, to developers is to carefully analyze what exactly makes each type successful. Uh, the goal is not to blindly copy, but to improve existing games or to create something at least slightly new. And then the chance of success will definitely increase. And also I could add here that uh, everybody should uh, follow the trends, should analyze the market, uh, should uh, learn how to predict trends as well. It's uh, very important. Now let's talk about a, a really big and important topic. So Zimat has a very wide and very great history of working with different IPs, and you've mentioned it in the beginning of the podcast. So we're talking about Disney, we're talking about big guys. So I'm pretty sure the majority of our listeners out there, they don't have such an experience, but they are really curious about it. So can you just to kick it off, give a brief description of the largest IP integration you did recently in your games? Yeah, sure. Uh, great topic. Uh, talk about um, everyone knows Disney, so I can tell a bit about this integration. Uh, yep, it's uh, unique content from old and new releases uh, from this uh, f from the company and uh, its movies and cartoons, mm -hmm. and it was uh, very warmly received by the audience of the game, uh, and this of course greatly helped us in developing our own uh, own uh, brand awareness. Uh, the unique feature of this collaboration was that all the content from Disney, Pixar, and Marvel was made uh, available to users absolutely absolutely free. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, unusual for the market. Uh, usually publishers make uh, this content premium. And it was definitely a great gift uh, for our players. And uh, the approach fully paid off in the result in terms of finances and in terms of some side benefits for, for the product and the, for the company. Uh, another important feature was that we... Uh, customized the in-game flow for players coming from Disney ad campaigns, which uh, increased their performance significantly. Uh, uh, we wanted to ensure these uh, players have have more comfortable entry and uh, quick access to all the available branded content uh, they are fond of. Interesting. So there there was no like direct monetization whatsoever. It's really unusual. So. I might say that this type of integration and partnership was working more towards the brand awareness overall than monetizing here and now, yeah? Uh, actually, um, if we, if we uh, talk about um, monetization site, uh, I would say, like, I would talk about uh, some maybe effective ways 
we monetized uh, any IP collaboration. Yeah, yeah, great idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say that we had uh, three main approaches to monetization, uh, which uh, have evolved over time. Uh, the first approach was uh, selling the paid IP puzzle packs. Uh, uh, is the approach we applied for uh, our first uh, strong IP uh, called uh, National Geographic. Uh, we worked with them uh, in uh, 2015. Then it was an uh, intermediate option a trial version of packs when a part of uh, the pack was free and you had to pay to open the whole pack of images. And uh, the third and current approach is uh, providing completely free IP content for the player. Uh, we started it uh, with Disney. Uh, the most effective approach appears uh, to be the option free, uh, where we provide uh, the content for free. Uh, so it allowed us to, uh, to increase UA volume stronger by attracting a new audience to the product. In this case, we uh, recoup uh, the collaboration through ads and partly uh, through payments of uh, non-IP packs or by subscriptions from these players. Uh, another important factor is that the release of IP content should be tied to relevant events, such as the release of a new movie or cartoon. Uh, as one of the last examples, we took this approach with The, the Little Mermaid, uh, movie recently when we created a special puzzle pack just before the movie released. So it's looks like that for the monetization side. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I think the, the right timing might do the trick because it can really boost the, both the monetization and the attention of the both players and payers. For those out there who don't have experience with big IPs and they don't even know how to approach these giant brands like Disney. What will you advise? So how did you start working with these large IPs integrations and what is the action plan or the main steps that usually happen when you work with big brands like Disney? Yeah, I will start with our first major partnership. It was with National Geographic in mm -hmm. uh, 2015. The logic was quite simple. Uh, on one hand, uh, there was a significant demand for puzzles with uh, nature and animals. On the other hand, we wanted to offer something truly high quality and unique to send out among competitors, mm -hmm. uh, who, as I mentioned, also often copied us as well. Uh, this led uh, us to initiate communication with NetGeo, uh, suggesting a mutually beneficial partnership. So the short formula is as follows. You must clearly understand what your audience wants. Mm -hmm. You find a partner with relevant con content uh, that meets the audience desires and you initiate communication with a partner uh, trying to agree on something you need. Uh, as for um, uh, strategically cho uh, choosing the uh, um, uh, IPs uh, for integration, it always starts with uh, identifying the audience unmet needs. We learn this through a detailed uh, market analysis, working with the user persona and through service uh, inside the game or in communities. Uh, after identifying the type of content, we begin a selection of uh, suitable potential partners. We can conduct uh, advanced tests of the pot potential performance of this content in the game. Uh, it's a subject to, to agreement with the partner. Um, along with this, we need to make sure that uh, the partner is ready to provide us with uh, images of the necessary quality and features. At least they should be uh, presented in high resolution and be suitable for assembling into a puzzle. Uh, if uh, the advanced tests are successful, we can move uh, on to uh, discussing the detailed terms of collaboration, trying to find a win-win combination with the partner, uh, which needs a careful uh, financial estimation in advance. Then, in case the uh, detailed terms suit both sides, uh, we then create and agree with the partner on a detailed uh, content plan and release schedule. Uh, the next step is uh, developing and implementing a product strategy for integrating uh, IP content, as well as specific strategy dedicated to promoting uh, this content and uh, operating with its target audience. It should be 
uh, specific aid creatives and uh, mm-hmm. customized user, flow, user flows, most likely. So this is a rough outline of how it works in practice. I think that's the best moment to jump to our last, but not this section. So we've got a little tradition here on games and names. We tend to discuss uh, what type of games or a game we can recommend to our viewers and listeners. This can be any game, mobile, PC, console. This can be a game that you've recently played or are playing right now and you really love or maybe hate it and you want to share it as well. So any game that you want to talk about is a good thing. Do you have anything that comes to your mind right right from the start? Yeah, uh, I will start with um, mobile segment. I can say mm-hmm. that I'm playing playing mobile games uh, much nowadays. It's most um, it's mostly in the work purposes, like monitoring competitors, what uh, new they're offering, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, my favorite releases of the last year on mobile maybe Monopoly Go because mm-hmm. it's one of the biggest uh, games. Uh, of the last year, uh, and maybe some mechanics, some new mechanics in hybrid casual like unpacking, which went mm-hmm. from Steam as well. Uh, if we talk about uh, uh, PC and console market, uh, I prefer more hardcore stuff, and I'm a fan of 3D shooters and sports simula- simulators. Uh, mm-hmm. And my voice goes to uh, Atomic Heart and uh, Phantom Liberty as DLC of Cyberpunk. So something like that. Great. Great choices. I really love the soundtrack to Atomic Heart. So I haven't yeah. <laughs> finished it yet, but the music is just so gorgeous. Like, wow. Exactly. Uh, from my side, I'd say that uh, right now uh, I'm actively playing uh, Brawl Stars once again because uh, Super Soul did a great job uh, with uh, powering up the game already in operational on already on some kind of scale. So they really put a big effort in making more content, more interesting regimes, more interesting uh, things to do in the game. So uh, I was really intrigued to th- see how they progressed uh, during this year, because I think the last time I played it, it was like a couple of years ago. So a long, a long time ago. And they did a great job. And I think uh, today I've seen the, the usual letter from uh, Supercell CEO, talking about the industry, about their approach. And Brawl Stars was one of the big success he mentioned from the last year. So something worth paying attention to. I've also started playing Top Troops. And this is something that I'm really intrigued about because uh, the game itself is very, very simple. It's a little bit even maybe hyper casual with meta elements from hybrid casual inside. But the creatives and the overall look it imitates Top War, and uh, you're thinking that you're playing a Forex strategy when in reality you're playing a much easier game, which is interesting because usually we've seen a, 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 an opposite approach when you have a an ad of a very easy game and you start the game and you see, for example, some very, very easy to grasp levels. And then like after half an hour or after an hour, you're playing a forex strategy with which is a, an absolutely different level of complexity. And talking about PC and consoles, I'd say that right now my choice here goes to Persona Reloaded, Persona 3. So this is the a very famous uh, series of games and I've been introduced to them I think a year ago with the Persona 5. I really love that one. So I was paying attention to the new reskin remake as well and it's it's wonderful i really love it so it plays really fresh it looks really fresh and i mean the ux ui of the main menus it's incredible i mean the the ux ui managers there they're absolutely crazy because i've never seen this level of uh, focusing on the different elements and making them unique so yeah for all the viewers and listeners out there i can highly recommend it Perfect. Then we've got this covered. We have our recommendations and we had a brilliant talk. So Dmitry, thank you for joining us today. I really hope that it was fruitful for our audience, both knowing about how to maintain a successful game for a long period of time 
about how to launch new games in already existing niche when there is a high competition going on. And also how to work with the IPs, especially with giant brands like National Geographic, Disney or Nickelodeon. What are the main ways how to understand whether or not these companies use you and how to progress with them. And of course, keep in mind that a lot of legal stuff will happen and you have to be ready that this journey is really long. So thank you for joining us today, Dmitry. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Stan. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for being a great host today. Uh, <laughs> I want to wish everyone a productive and profitable year. Uh, just keep pushing the envelope. Do not hesitate to innovate and everything will be okay. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's, I think, the best uh, the best suggestion that could have been. Yeah, so to all the listeners, all the viewers, thank you for staying with us till this moment. Take care and see you. Bye-bye.